Welcome back, friends. You may have noticed that things have been a little less than consistent lately, and while I won't apologize for it, I'll try to make it up to you nonetheless. The past few weeks have been a whirlwind, with the majority of time being taken up both preparing for and attending WPPI, a huge photo conference out in Las Vegas. I had planned to record a bunch of interviews while I was out there and bring back snippets from a lot of new guests, but that just never really happened. So instead, I thought I'd create another Focal Points episode with Johnny Edward and have a deep dive into all things WPPI. Johnny and I share a room at the Mirage as we have at several other conferences, and we do it for a variety of reasons, to save money, to hang out, and more importantly, to make sure that we both escape Vegas alive. And I suppose if you're hearing this, we were successful on all counts. This conversation is a long one, clocking in at a little over two hours, so I've decided to split it into two parts. In this first part, we talk about our completely different experiences at this year's WPPI, some of the good, the bad, and of course, our unsolicited opinions on what we could do better when it comes to the shooting base. Part two is a bit more lighthearted, and while only time will tell if it's the right thing to do to be this honest, You'll hear about Johnny's post WPPI workshop, which led to our last night in Vegas, which was the closest I'll ever get to living like Hunter S. Thompson. So let's dive right in to a full recap of WPPI 2024 on this episode of Focal Points with my friend Johnny Edward. <laughs> Actually, I am digging the the new setup. You put new shelves in and some old cameras. And yeah, yeah, I, I decided just to. Well, the environmental thing. I actually got that from you. Going like, all right, I love this spatial thing, but giving a little bit more context and bringing in some visual things. So if someone goes around the frame, there's actually something to look at, which was my fucking poison. Because I'm like, all right, well, those aren't lit now. So fucking projector here, projector there, rim light fucking here. And then as soon as I got into it, I was just like, oh my fucking god, like, what am I doing with my life? How's it been the week post WPPI? Are, have you survived like I have, or are you still all a mess? I'm still, I mean, I'm good, but I'm I'm still a mess. You know, I think <laughs> I'm a good mess. Mm. Um, I think there. there's there's always a refractory period for me after these conferences. I'll say I, I felt the best after this that I've ever felt after a conference. Um, but it was just the the sort of emotional, social taxing of it all, the cumulative effect. And it was really good. By and large, I met great people. You and me hanging out the entire time was wonderful. There were all these really positive aspects, but it's just, I am an introvert extrovert. And that extrovert part of me was very well fed. And the introvert part of me was completely fucking starved. Yeah. So I got back famished and I'm like, all right, I need to retreat into myself. And so I did the Netflix and chill, yeah. you know, and fucking just ordered in food and ate like seven pizzas in one day and had heartburn for 24 hours straight. But then there were all of these looming things that I still needed to do for stuff that was upcoming. So I gave myself about 24 hours of nothing and then automatically was like, all right, I have to jump back into the fucking fire now because I'm so behind the curve. So I've just been chasing my tail a little bit and trying to do the self-care, but also trying to be pragmatic so that the self-care doesn't turn into not necessarily self-destruction, but self-harm in a way where I'm postponing things that really cannot be postponed reasonably. You want to decompress. You want to give yourself time to just kind of get back into that mental space. But there's always that looming, oh, I sh you know, I just missed a week and I need to play catch up. How am I going to do that? And it's finding that balance. I know for me, it was kind of the same. My, my introvert got fed because I basically shut myself off from society all week. And then my extrovert side at WPPI, I forced to happen. Because it took me so long to get back home after your workshop, that Friday night, hung out. We'll talk about that Friday night in a little bit. The Saturday I spent at, at the airport and then took the red eye home. While I'm taking the red eye home, time changed, right? The time change happened. So by the time I landed, I was like that Robin Williams meme. I'm like, what year is it? I had no clue when I landed in Boston. 
<laughs> where I was, what year it was, did anything really just happen or did I just dream this past week? So this whole week after WPPI has been really trying to just get my body clock going. And yep. unlike you, I don't have a million things on my plate, but I was still trying to feel like I was playing catch up and get organized again. And I've got all my legal pads and all my to-do lists and all my things. And I still don't feel like I've gotten my feet back underneath me. Yeah. So, you know, what I find really interesting is we had so much time, right? We'd meet up in the, we'd meet up in the hotel room be like, all right, what's the game plan? And I'd see you run off and I'd run off in a different direction, but we had vastly different experiences <laughs> during the so. entire week. So I was fully just attending, hanging out, doing my thing. And you were in booths and teaching and modeling. I know every time that I walked by your booth, it was swamped. How did you manage the modeling and the teaching and the crowd control and all of that at once. I was getting so much sensory overload. I couldn't handle it. How did you do it? The best I could. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's probably the answer. Um, you know, so for me, I, the modeling thing is fun for me. I'm not going to lie. Obviously yeah. I like being in front of the camera. I wanted, I wanted to teach. So I wanted to teach and speak at WPPI. Um, they didn't give me that opportunity directly. I think it's something weird that's happened at the past couple of conferences where they know I have a certain look and a certain energy and charisma and however we want to sort of categorize that. So they decide to sort of, for lack of better phrasing, pigeonhole me into the modeling thing, which is all well and good, but it's not where my heart's really at. And I feel like in a way who I am is misallocated when I'm just simply standing in front of the camera. And that's just my take. And obviously I'm very biased in that. So my ask for them was, I'm like, listen, I'll do this in one of the bays. However, I don't want someone sort of like almost teaching or guiding or like bodyguarding me while I'm doing it. I still want to be able to interact with these photographers and teach them. And I probably bit off more than I could chew with that. But it gave me a chance to actually properly connect because I feel like at these you know conferences, and of course, we'll talk about this more. In a bit, so often, if there's a photographer, they walk up and they see the model and they're like, good, cool, right? Well, thank you, I'm I'm Bill. And they walk away. Right. Um, and I wanted more than that. So for me, I think I, I always subdivide things in my mind. I've done this since I was a kid. So like, I can't look at the totality of something because the anxiety sets in and I get so fucking mired in it that then I'm like, this seems like a good solution. And that's not for those of you who are just listening and you can't see there was a gun to my head, not a real gun, but a finger gun, bang, bang. Um, but I realized there's so much ahead of me that I just sort of get paralyzed. So yeah. I literally looked at the single person in front of me, you know, when I was there at the booth and everything on the periphery disappeared. Yeah. And so that's why I, I think I, I came across as so genuine because I, I was. So if you were there, I'd be like, hey, Matt, what's yeah. going on? What do you have going on? Here's our lighting setup today. We can turn this on. We can turn this off. What are you feeling mood wise? Like, this is what I can do. Here's some ideas for you, but I'm here for you. So what do you want? And I think in doing that, I allowed myself like each thing drained me, but it also recharged me because it felt more intimate. Sure. So if I wouldn't have done that and sort of like gone above and tried to connect in a more direct way with people, I think I would have just gotten eviscerated yeah. by the whole thing. But each little thing was a microcosm unto itself. And of course, by the time you know, one o'clock and I was fucking famished and they're like, you have to take a break. And I'm like, well, there's 20 people and I feel fucking bad because they've been here for 30 minutes and they had to whip me and tell me to go eat, you know, beef and broccoli in the back or whatever the fuck was staged. But I, I think it was, it was really for me trying to make the most of it. Like I've been at a lot of these conferences and, you know, it's sort of like a high school lock in at the bowling alley when someone sneaks in mushrooms and vodka. And so... <laughs> You know, it's just been like, oh, we're fucking here and we're adults, but we're also right. kids and we're away from responsibilities. And I told myself, I'm like, well, that's fine. And that's well and good. But I actually wanted to make the most of it and focus on just connection in a way that I hadn't before. And so I probably haven't answered the question at all. I'm doing the politician thing. That's no, a great no, I, no, I think you did. So one of the things I have a love hate relationship with the shooting base. Right. Mm -hmm. So having experienced them for so many years at the portrait master's. It's always been a really cool thing to be able to have, you know, almost an infinite array of models and backgrounds and lighting setups. And you can go and really 
create stuff for your portfolio or just learn different lighting setups or learn how to interact with the model. Like I really loved that. The hate side of it is that because I rely so much on connection, I only get two minutes, maybe yeah. three minutes. Now, the way that I shoot, I like to try to be intentional. And I say, all right, I'm going to go into this booth with this lens. I'm going to take three frames. I'm going to switch to this lens, take three yeah. more frames, and then be done. That could take me two minutes. It could take me 10 minutes. I have no idea what I'm walking into, but yeah. usually two minutes is plenty of time for me. This year, I felt like every time I wandered into a shooting bay, it was really rushed. It was, I felt very out of sorts and yeah. it had nothing to do with the models. All of the models that I worked with were great, but I just felt this overwhelming overload, this, yeah. this sensory overload. It was, maybe it's, there was too many people, too many cross conversations. I yeah. didn't feel like I could connect and I just wound up avoiding the shooting bays altogether and then just observing what was going on. So there were a couple of bays that I saw that were really, really good. Yours obviously was nonstop action. And every time I looked over, I'm like, of course he's in an Aunt Jemima bonnet and wings. And then the next day it's like, of course he's a Cubanismo, right? So your styling was great. I thought Mitzi Starkweather's booth was great. Oh, with, phenomenal. Which is yeah. kind of like the polar opposite of what you had with all the styling yeah. and the attention hers was very stripped down for the raw portrait stuff and people were having a blast with it and i love yeah. that a lot of the other bays what i saw was the paparazzi the yeah. the piranhas right so even while one person is engaged with the model and working with them you've got crowds of people around just shooting over the shoulder one it's annoying two yeah annoying to watch right yeah. because they're so consumed with that people aren't getting out of your way just being yeah. societally polite the third thing and i had to wonder this as a photographer i'm like what what pictures are you getting with yeah. that and i saw it all week it wasn't just the like the the shooting bay alley it was everywhere oh it was it was tpm it was the parties we attended and, and those things everything I, I think people feel like they're going to miss a moment and yeah. i've got to capture everything rather than just being present and observing and taking yeah. pictures with your eyes rather than just your camera and i feel like there's this need to shoot 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 and less of a need to just sit back and think do i even need this image yeah, absolutely is this something that i could use or sell or market a lot of the times the styling is so over the top. And I mean that in a good way. It's so yeah, yeah. fantastic. It's so beautiful. There's not a lot of people that sell that kind of work. Of course. Right. And I just, I wonder with all of these photographers, they're taking all these pictures. What is it that they're learning? And I ask that honestly, I don't know what it is that they're going home with because I know, I think I shot a total of 70 usable frames the entire week right before this call i was showing you some of them that was the best of the best yeah. and i really didn't shoot a whole lot because there wasn't anything that i could really pull into my own business yeah. so my experience with the shooting bays was just that too many people too much too little intentionality and too much just trying to capture 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 because i'm there let me just shoot everything yeah, I don't know. I, I find that weird, especially amongst so many photographers that there's so little intention. Did you well, feel I, people coming into your booth that they had an intention? I, I think my experience was probably different simply because like people who were there could see that I was interacting and asking for that level of intention from people. Got it. So I think there's the aspect of like what someone brings to the table. And then there is sort of like us on the other side of that in production, as models, as mentors, as whatever, in, in the intention that we're setting for people. Right. So part of it is their mindset, and part of it is the mindset or framework that we're creating for them. So I think, you know, and there was that fucking line that was going around the side, and I looked, and I went, whoa, shit. <laughs> um, but every single person who was coming up saw me walk up and once again say, like, hey, what's going on, Matt? This is what's happening. Yeah. Like, we have a key light. We have a backlight. If my hat's on, I suggest keeping it on for separation if it's off. I'm a shiny motherfucker. Let's turn it off because that's right. not the greatest look for me. And you're not going to love those photos. So there was that element. And I'm like, do you want the jacket on? Do you want the jacket off? Do you want me sad right. melancholy? 
the most requested fucking thing that I got from everyone, of course, was, can you be the Joker? And I was like, yeah, I can be a, I can be a um, complete fucking maniac that's been castigated <laughs> by society and left by the wayside. I think I can manufacture that persona. But, so I think part of it was me, but I, I did see that. And like you and me spent that day when I first got in at TPM shooting some of the bays. And obviously you saw what I did. Like I went in and I felt the same way that you did. I got a couple of shots that I really loved. And then I, I you know, tried to modify the base. So I turned off a fill light in one of them and that felt really good, but it's the same thing. It, I think there is this essence almost of like I versus us yeah. for a lot of people. And I know that sounds like something that would be in like a yoga teacher training. People are there and they're so encapsulated in themselves that they're missing out on the greater experience. It's like, what am I going to get? What am I going to create? I need this. I need that. Instead of being like, oh, fuck, I'm in line with all of these other people. Here's a maternity photographer. Here's a family portrait photographer. Here's a fashion photographer. Oh, fuck. Here's a famous photographer that I adore who's in line waiting. Or here's someone who's asked me for advice. And so we just lose sight of everything that's around us and become so myopic that we're so obsessed. And then there's this like economic value thing where it's like, well, I paid X hundreds of dollars to be here and I'm paying X hundreds of dollars to this fucking hotel that's just raking me over the coals and charging me 20 bucks for water. And there's this and there's that. I need to recoup my investment by shooting 2,000 frames a day, even though none of those frames have any value whatsoever. But I think it's just people being too wrapped up in and lost in themselves and their experience and in that closing themselves off to the greater experience and the greater connections. And for me, that's what it's really fucking all about. But it's just a different mindset given where I'm at in my journey. And I know you yep. feel similarly, but to to come back around, yes, I absolutely saw that. I absolutely experienced that. And, and I think Mitzi was a great thing, you know, her having people prompt, like essentially forcing the photographers who were at her bay to interact, changed the dynamic totally. because then it wasn't just the paparazzi. It was like, oh, hey, Matt, be, be happy. Be sad, be scared, be surprised. And it was so campy, but that was beautiful because it allowed two people to actually exist amidst that chaos in a more significant way versus like, oh, here's a really beautiful statuesque blonde model whose style could torn. All of us are just going to photograph her like on the red carpet and forget the fact that we're actually portrait photographers and the fact that this is actually a fucking person in front of us. And that's unfortunate for everyone. Um, and I also think, you know, overtly WPPI is trying to shift, of yeah. course, like everyone's trying to pivot in this industry right now. And so they brought in those shooting bays to a degree that has never been present at WPPI before. And that's, of course, part of the merger with TPM and taking and appropriating things here and there. But I don't necessarily think they were even ready production wise for how fucking excited people would be to be able to do something interactive. And so there probably wasn't even enough foresight into how to properly prepare the models and the staff that were running these booths to say, this is what it's going to be like. This is how we deal with things. This is how we mediate and set precedent and tone and intention. And that's not a fault of anyone. It's just the nature of evolution and how these things sort of move forward. I don't think they were prepared the powers that be right. Cause they introduced the, the shooting base a couple of years ago. Yeah. And when they first got introduced, I want to say it was, I want to say it was two years ago that they first introduced shooting yeah. base. And People didn't know what they were or what exactly. to do with them. Last year, they were a little bit more integrated and people started to get the feel for it. This year, it seemed like there was a lot of attention on it. The only logistical problem I saw with it, outside of my own feelings about lines and waiting and all that, is the area in which it was compressed, right? Agreed. So for those of you that weren't at WPPI, there was one area of the trade hall where Peter Hurley was trying to set a record for the most amount of headshots in a day. And I don't know if he reached it or not, the Guinness Book of World Records, but he had like an entire end of the trade show hall for just all these headshot stations, which was kind of cool. Yeah. I think from the standpoint of where they have the shooting bays this year in essentially one aisle in one row if they were spread out a little bit further to give a bit more space i think it would feel less intense Agreed. and allow the people to connect a little bit more with the models with the booth mentors with whoever might be there it felt very cramped and you know i just found myself spinning in circles going are you are you in line am i in somebody else's shot i heard that a lot <laughs> you know and there's 
people there shooting with 300 millimeter lenses and they're you know basically standing in the booth across the hall yep. so yeah. i think from a logistical standpoint it proved that people love this type of amenity at a trade show yeah. the the thing that i think they still need to work out is the logistics of where how properly spaced out how staffed like all that sort of stuff well, and that and will I, work itself out in time for sure of course and i think there is there's also a twofold benefit if that were to be more segmented people would be able to essentially have a little bit of a blinder on because it's all not happening at the same place but that also would create better flow throughout the show floor for vendors as well um you know because i know personally like when i was just walking like as soon as i would get off i'm like i wanted to connect with sigma i wanted to connect with sony i just didn't have the bandwidth for that like once they let me off for my break i'm like by the time i walk three city blocks to where food staging is at (laughs) stuff my face like it's the mess hall put my plate up and get back i'm still going to be five minutes late Right. So I didn't have I didn't have the time for that. But what I did see was it was so heavily weighted to that right side of the room that vendors who were on the other side were sort of left by the wayside. So okay. I think they could probably strategically place those shooting bays, not only to create separation and distinction, but also some semblance of almost like feng shui right. or flow throughout the trade show floor that would benefit attendees, vendors, models, and just everyone. Um, it would be a win-win all around. So we'll We'll see what happens, especially that they're, you know, switching over to the Rio, which is a whole other thing entirely. I've never been to the Rio. I think it'll be interesting, but I swear to God, if they don't put some fucking water on the trade show floor, <laughs> I it really astounded me. And I don't know if that was a call of Emerald with the trade show. I assume mm-hmm. not. I assume it was probably something to do with the, uh, the hotel, casino, yeah. and conference center. The fact that there was unless i missed it there were no water stations anywhere no. inside the trade show and i think just from a, a human rights standpoint no i agree you can't have that Brilliant. because the closest water was either drinking from the bathroom taps which yeah i ain't gonna do Pass. or walking you know a quarter of a mile yep. back to starbucks to get a seven dollar bottle of water and yep. then walk all the way back to the trade show that's got to be fixed well um, I, I i found it kind of weird too like i spent time growing up in arizona and literally like it's illegal in arizona to deny someone water because you're dealing with that same desert environment so you have people coming from all around the world different sea levels different environments who aren't prepared for that you have people who maybe drink two or three times a year who went out to the capri bar had an open bar and literally became fucking the walking dead the day after <laughs> looking like california raisins because they were dehydrated to the point where i could feel their kidneys shutting down like tangibly so i agree that was that was a big oversight not on even any type of service but just to say like hey like if someone's insanely dehydrated number one it's a massive health risk for them but like you're not going to have a good time if you're short four liters of water like your brain doesn't retain dopamine's not being made your reward system is short fucking circuited so just like give people water even snacks perhaps you know fucking granola bars something have nature's valley come in and we could just have crumbs all over the fucking show floor you know but that's a, a, that's a very foundational thing you want to you want to keep people at your booth canon fuji nikon yeah. have just bins of yeah. water right literally just yeah. little grab and time goes. shares time share status you have to hear me talk about the sony a1 if you want 24 ounces of water and people would have been like, oh, that's fucking that's oh, amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I need a, I need a global shutter. Like that's fucking cool, man. I mean, the, the, let's, let's step back just a second and give a huge high five to Fuji because yeah. we walked into that big, like opening night Capri party. And, you know, you and I both walked into WPPI planning to have an entirely sober week. Yeah. And, you know, I know that I've been, sober pretty much for a couple of months now and it was feeling great and i'm going into wppi and i'm feeling the best i felt in a long time we go to the party and we're dressed up and we're just kind of chilling out and i'm gonna go get my you know 11 dollar water at the club and then uh bartender's like well it's open bar and i said "Eh, excuse me and it was literally this it was half fucking off like what did you just say to me and (laughs) he was just like oh it's open bar i'm like Oh, oh, this is this is not good. Um, so that being said, while we did maintain moderate control that night, every it's like they locked the doors and just shit went off the rails. 
it was, was a phenomenal party like it yeah. was a great time but like you said it was like kids with no supervision yeah. and we were only there from what 9 30 to maybe midnight thereabouts oh. whenever they whenever they closed the club yep and it's it was the most crowded i had ever seen it people were dancing on poles bodies everywhere just people stumbling from bar to bar and then everybody spilled out at the same time with that same thousand yard stare like what manic dead shark where am i what am i doing and oh my god we've got to get up in three hours (laughs) to start the day (laughs) It was a it was a great party. I had a really really good time, um, but that kind of set the stage for the whole week of saying, "All right, we're definitely going to need more Gatorade." I'm going to Walgreens. What do you need? On on that note too, it's this this is completely sort of. I mean, it's it's a line, but also it's not. What's curious to me about the corporate entities, and of course, like we can talk about all these brands, ultimately they're all just, you know, these large corporations and they have their own agendas, but you take someone like Fuji, like they're fucking rad. I know you're a Fuji shooter. I've been trying to get my hands on the GFX system for literally years now. I've been talking with them and I've been on the waiting list. I was supposed to have it at TPM last year. I didn't. So I'm like the amount of money that was allocated to that party and once again there's no regrets from me like it was right. fucking rad we had a great time but i think all right i know how many photographers and artists are vying to be able to either work with a new piece of fuji gear or kit that they don't have or explore the fuji ecosystem and they can't do it so i don't even want to fucking fathom how much money was spent on fuji on that party for something that ostensibly people aren't going to remember like, right. they're not going to associate it with Fuji. They're going to associate it with the person they danced with or someone who right. stole their pants or hat or self-respect or whatever the fuck it may have been. So I'm like, where? who is the decision maker who decides, like, hey, we're going to allocate four, five, six digits toward booze. But, like, when we have someone who literally might want to invest their career into our ecosystem, we're not going to allow them to explore that opportunity. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's a very curious thing to me overall. And that's a philosophical sort of thing. We don't need to delve into necessarily, but it's odd. No, but it's, it's true. Right. So marketing budgets are a thing. It, and it always makes me laugh because, you know, I see all that. And again, I love Fuji and watching Victor, you know, look out over this crowd. He's like my people, you know, <laughs> my, my people in, in party, like these are goes keep drinking. Like, yeah. yes, it was great. But I talked to uh, my friend Stacy, who's one of the, the marketing heads at Fuji and yeah, basically saying, you know, like this has been a great show, but when I look at the budgets, like you said, where is the best allocation of funds? And this goes yeah. for any company, small or large yep. is what is it that you're trying to accomplish? Is it brand loyalty? Is it exposure for your products, right? They had the big um, X106 launch. Yeah. And it's always interesting to to see what their expected outcome is for the, yeah. the marketing dollars. Yeah, and, absolutely. you know, I look at all the small booths as well, and I say, wow, they probably paid 10, 15 grand just to have a booth. Oh, and yeah. the smallest, the smallest footprint. Yeah, yeah. literally the, the closet boot. No, knocks on closet boots. That's still presence. And I was, I'm always curious. I try to go by those small booths and talk to the people there and get a feel for why are you doing this? Yeah. Why are you here at this trade show? Because it brings me to my question to you. Are trade shows dead? Are trade shows even worth it? anymore when we have access to everybody we need to get access to we have all these small workshops and retreats popping up all over the place you can learn anything on the internet you can go to any camera store and play with anything what's the appeal and i'm i'm asking this because i'm trying to solidify my own thoughts on it and i don't know but i feel like the the big trade show that we all know is dying a slow death and they're doing everything that they can to make it more interesting. I feel like when five years, no one's going to be going to trade shows. So as, as a whole, like overtly, I would agree with you. I think that the 
the consumer demand has changed. I think the marketplace has changed. Obviously, the dynamic of what's available to us, where, when, and how has changed. Right. Um, and I think that's probably why WPPI pivoted so hard into that shooting bay aspect of it, because they realized that this almost window shopping, educator speaking at the artist thing is becoming less and less relevant with each right. passing day, passing season, passing year. So I don't, I don't know that if as a whole it's dead. I think as we know it, it is dead. And, and I think this was sort of a resuscitation of sorts, like trying to pivot. And I think these companies are realizing that too. And in large companies, for instance, Matt Group, who handles, you know, Nanlight and Ellen Chrome here in the US, Gravity Backdrops, a bunch of others, they had zero presence. Right. They decided that it wasn't relevant for them to allocate marketing dollars because the past couple of trade shows like this have not proven a measurable return on that investment. Right. And so I think we're seeing that happening more and more. So it's almost like, you know, the, the academian type of thing. It's, it's an evolve or die, like the publisher perish. I think that's what we're seeing now in this, in this side of things. It's evolve or die. And I think overall, in a way, to me, it's a little bit heartening because what I see as being a catalyst for this is people are craving more intimate and authentic experiences. They want something that's more centered on community. They want something that's more centered on them. They want dialogue, not monologues. They want to have conversations and just not be talked at or to or sold to, especially. And so I don't know. I'm not really sure where it's going to go, but I do think that that so much has changed and especially with the pandemic and how we emerged from that for better and for worse and what fell by the wayside and what was magnified and especially the mindset surrounding this industry. Um, There's also, of course, just a massive faction of people who have no fucking interest in learning going to these things. They're not going to buy new gear. They just want to go because it's something that they might be able to write off and party and have fun and connect. And that's something else entirely. So I think that contingent will continue forward because so many people are working, you know, multiple jobs or 60 hours a week and have their partners and have their families and have their kids and have all of these responsibilities. And they get to like, go, hey, you know, I'm going to better myself when in reality, bettering yourself is just getting smashed. And I support that wholeheartedly. I think I think that's great. I think we all need to step away from the humdrum and routine and mundane elements of life and just fucking let loose and sort of tune into who we are at a baser level and primitive nature and things like that. So I think in that way, this will probably be kept afloat by that sort of sub faction or subsect or however you want to phrase that of people who are there just to fucking have fun. Economics change, society changes, the political landscape changes. And so if things tighten up, there's other ways to have fun that are more economically feasible where you're not in fucking Las Vegas, once again, paying $10 for a glass of water or $45 for a Woodford at the center bar from a bartender who has no fucking interest in even looking you in the eye. We start um, with those guys. So um, to answer your question, I, I do. I, I think I think the, the model as it has existed is dying. And the yeah. question is whether these entities and the powers that be will sort of operate from an agile standpoint to see what's changing and to actually be of service and accommodate that, their people, their community, or if they'll continue to lumber on as many corporate entities do and just sort of fade into obscurity under the guise of whatever their mission statement or fucking ethos or, or whatever that might be. So it's, it's going to be sort of intriguing to watch possibly in a slightly macabre way, but time will tell. One of the things that I saw a lot more of this year, and I don't have the stats. It just felt like there were more photo walks, less seminars that the seminars that were, Um, free were so overlapped that you had to pick and choose because there were so many other photo walks that you basically had one seminar in the morning, one seminar in the afternoon. I'm, I, I'm making, you know, big, large general statements, but the fact is I didn't go to any of the photo walks. I didn't want to spend the money quite frankly on 150 bucks, 250 bucks, whatever it was for an hour, an hour and a half with, uh, with somebody. But I, understand the appeal of small class situations now where i think there's room for brands is rather than having these photo walks or infuse the photo walks like i think fuji did some photo walks straight from their booth what you did with your workshop at the end of the week was you know bringing in 
lights from nan light and you know um styling from so trendy and having all of these different brands work at one workshop in yeah. cohesion was a great way to expose really interested parties to a brand to interact yeah. with it to really play with it not so much in the show floor where you're being pushed a coupon or a qr code and just go learn more about it here shuffled along yeah just shuffled along you know i think if there's that level of interaction there's room for more of that however right. the proliferation of the photo walks i feel is cannibalizing the crowd that is there to do other things and go to some yeah. of these seminars. And I feel like it's just a little bit out of balance. If I'm paying to go to a trade show and then for everything that I want to do at the trade show, I've got to pay more. The add on. It starts to, it starts to feel like someone's hand is always in my pocket. Mm -hmm. Right. Versus Very when so. I was going to portrait masters, you pay the premium for the ticket. Yeah. And then you have access to everything and everybody kind of floats along yeah. to the same things. And you all experience it together. And that creates this incredible culture with yeah. WPPI. I understand it's 10 times, 20 times the size of the old portrait masters. I understand that, you know, it's a, it's a function of scale, what you can yeah. do, but it felt like there's the people that go on photo walks there's the people that just go to the trade show. There's the people that are there just to party. And it feels disjointed from a, a photography community standpoint. Yeah, I agree. Now, you step back a little bit and you look at the grand perspective. And it's great to have all that creativity in one place. However, it just, I felt this year very disjointed in my interactions with people and i found that i was just gravitating towards my circle of friends yeah. and even though i was trying to branch out and meet new people and network with different companies and vendors that had some great great conversations it felt a bit more scattered so yeah. i don't know if that is the introduction of the portrait masters the lighting masters the wedding masters the yeah. icon awards right there was a lot that shifted this year so inherently there was going to be a little bit of chaos but i don't know for for my standpoint i've only gone for a couple of prior years but having gone to trade shows in vegas for the better part of a decade this one felt a little bit scattered not in a bad way but just kind of like Ah, it's it's like that awkward teenage years. Yeah, right. I, I know WPPI has been around forever, but it just yeah. felt like there's a shift happening, and they don't quite know where it's going to shift to. So it's on people like us to give feedback and say, yeah. "Hey, here's what worked and what didn't work." Not in a bad way. It's just you know constructive criticism. Yeah, so very much so. I'm 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 interested to hear over the next few weeks, kind of the fallout from other people. Yeah. Um, that being said, there's a handful of things that I saw there that I don't know if it was the mirage, if it was the caliber of photographers that are coming through. I don't like to sit in judgment, but I saw. <laughs> no, we will. <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm going to. I'm going to climb right up on my throne. The fucking creepy guys with cameras really upset me. Yeah, and agree. It's very, you know, and, and you've heard me talk about this before. There's a certain type of photographer that is there to capture content. Maybe they're pro, maybe they're not. But yeah. their vibe that comes across where the model, the subject is nothing but an inanimate object there for their pleasure. Yeah. And it got really weird in some instances, I'd walk by a booth, not necessarily even in the shooting base, wasn't there. Yeah. But, you know, some brands bring in a model um, for lighting or for outfits or whatever. And um, there's a woman, Mimi, a uh, tattoo model, right? Oh, yeah. Mimi's amazing. Yeah. Amazing personality, yeah. like yeah. tons of fun. Yeah. And I saw her working in one booth for a brand. And forgive me, I just, I don't know the brand. Yeah. But the amount of guys with cameras that just kind of descended and yeah. were, were literally shooting over shoulders and around and getting in angles. And there's no regard for 
who else is around. There's no regard for the model in their comfort. There's yeah. no regard for what the images are going to look like. There's no intentionality. And I can't, I can't think of a way to filter that out because it's nothing but my perception. Yeah, of course. It seems to be that there's a, a group of attendees that approach photography as I'm going to create content to get me followers from a certain creepy set of yeah. followers. Is, am I making sense of this? I don't, I don't no, know how to no, say you it. Are. I'm kind of like a complete douche nugget, but, yeah, but I, I mean think no, I, I think I think you're you're absolutely accurate with that. And moreover, I think that's probably the 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 better side of that very disingenuous sort of ugly coin. Like if they're creating content to try and like get followers, there's one thing. I think there were a lot of people who were just interested in having power over another person mm. and being able yeah. to objectify a person. So if it goes to this idea of all right, I'm getting a return on this, I still get the goosebumps and it's like, ooh, yuck. But I think there were a lot of people who weren't even interested in taking it that far. It was purely like, all right, I can be in proximity to someone who I find sexy or, well, hold on one second. You're going straight to voicemail. That's why we should turn off our phones when we do podcasts. I've, I've gotten sort of into contentious um, conversations with fellow photographers over the course of time, let's say the past half decade about this. But I do think that it's beholden to us as a community, as um, you know, a conference, let's say WPPI or TPM. Um, as individuals, as artists, as entrepreneurs, as human beings to safeguard those who are in vulnerable positions. And I feel like the ball is more often than not dropped in that regard where, you know, no one wants to ruffle any feathers and it's kind of like, hey, keep people safe, but like don't rub someone the wrong way. And so no precedents are set, no boundaries are set. And it becomes sort of this like no holds barred type of thing. And that's that's really unfortunate because if you get that archetype into an event like this and they're like, Oh yeah, I can go over and walk up to a model and be like, "Hey, that's really nice. Can you like give me those like bedroom eyes?" And they're right. saying it with this voice as they're just clicking and they're not even paying attention to what we're doing. We're all very hyper aware of what that actually is, but no one's going like, "Hey, like let's step back because they don't want to create tension." Um, but then in the process of not creating tension, we're just reinforcing these archetypes. We're emboldening these people to carry on and if they feel like, "Oh, I can do this in public," While I'm on display, while there's a professional model and a professional mentor and a professional booth and professionals around me, that gives them wings to soar into whatever awful shit they do in their personal lives behind closed doors. And that's something that we as a community have to take into consideration and say, like, what are we collectively going to do sure. to make sure that people are safe and valued and respected? And there's really not a lot of neuronal activity given to that. Um, issue, honestly, from the top down. We want to be polite. We want to give people the benefit of the doubt. We don't want to create waves. If someone's coming to our booth, right, and we get a weird vibe from them, we're going to let them do their thing and take yeah. off and then acknowledge that it was a little bit weird and creepy, but not do anything about it. So yeah. it's a strange thing to try to manage um, being polite and then also maintaining a standard of professionalism. Yeah. So it was just something that I observed. I mean, as, as the week goes on, I get more and more in my own head as I witness more, as I'm around more and more people and I start to shut down and I look for ways to, get out of the norm, right? I've already talked yeah. to most of my friends. I've seen them. I've connected. It's great. Now I'm just overloaded. There's yeah. so much coming at me and I, I'm someone that needs quiet. I need yeah. just breathing room. And very rarely are you afforded that in the five, seven days that you're at WPPI because you're always running back and forth to something. Yeah. And whether it's to just go back to your room to change your socks or get a, a 37, I'm just going to keep increasing, increasing the price, $37 <laughs> bottle of water, or, you know, I've got to get to this seminar. Or I want to go see this thing at this booth at three yeah. o'clock. What I find that I do is I get very selfish and I start cutting people off yeah. and texting, Hey, not going to make it not going to yep. be there can't do it, need some time yep. because I just want to sit down. Yeah. And the interesting thing is we find, especially those of us that have a large community of friends that are scattered all over the country, that these are the moments where we have the chance to be together, 
right? And it's not the same thing as being on a Zoom like this or even in a workshop, you know, you have a finite time to see your friends and you want to spend a lot of time with them. But it's really not set up for that unless you no. want to eschew everything that you paid to go to Vegas for and just no. go hang out with your friends, right? I'm very much so. so. So I found myself, you know, pulling away quite a bit. And it was the the times where I could have quiet or got invited to a bar by a friend and just went and had a drink or a meal and just sat one-on-one. -on -one. Those yeah. were my favorite times of WPPI Same. because it's that real settle down connection everything slows down you don't feel like you're at this breakneck pace and you yep. don't have a thousand people shouting around you i find that towards the end of the week i started doing more and more and more of that and avoiding the big group dinners and the parties and while it seems to be introverted it's more self-protection than yeah. anything else i just very much I so couldn't handle <laughs> any more <laughs> any more conversations and i think what i noticed is throughout the week there were a lot of people like that just getting mentally worn out not so much physically but just mentally exhausted from doing all the things all week absolutely you know one of the things that i was looking forward to all week was your workshop and i wanted to talk yeah. about that a little bit because you and paulina gwaltney got together and created this workshop that was going to be a mix of your lighting teaching and her styling education and yep. Nanlite came through with what looked like an 18 wheeler full of lights in every way, shape and form. And it Thank was, you, Nanlite. let's talk about the workshop a little bit yeah, because please. I got to see it behind the scenes and then also participate in it. And then in the, we'll talk about what happened afterwards. The, but, the, 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 un, the unseen veil lifted shit show on the back end. It wasn't a shit show. It was, no, it, it was surprising surprising uh turn of events yeah absolutely. <laughs> Just that. but we haven't had a chance to even kind of debrief since we have the workshop so i want to hear what wild. your thoughts on it were so for me this is obviously I, I run workshops frequently here at my studio which is where i'm at right now and this is this is home you know like i know this place inside and out i know the gear that i have i know the backdrops that i have i know models i know creative teams this is my safe space because not only do i know the space but if anything goes wrong, I have 17 contingency plans. Right. It's plan B, plan C, plan D, plan E, plan F. So there's stress when I run it, but there's really not because I know I can always fall back into another safety net or a broader safety net. So I challenged myself this year to say, hey, like I'm not going to be teaching at WPPI because they didn't invite me to do that. But this is something that I really want to be able to do for myself and members of the community. Let's put on a workshop that's one day. And collaborating with Paulina, because of course, like she has a skill set that's beyond me. I'm really great at styling. That's her domain of expertise. Right. So I'm like, we can put on something that's one day that's at a great studio that brings together people who are genuinely interested in learning in a more significant way than what they're able to do at WPPI. And it gives me a chance to sort of flex my muscles as um, an educator and a mentor and challenge myself to be like, all right, like I have... 14 hours of studio time to build a complete setup that pseudo mirrors my space and break it down, get it back out. And so I wanted to get uncomfortable. Right. I think that's, you know, where we grow. And so part of it was like, all right, I, I kept questioning this in the days leading up to WPPI and the weeks where I'm like, am I making a really big fucking mistake with this? Like, is this just going to be a fucking complete debacle? And it wasn't. Yeah. Um, and a big part of that is obviously people like you, people like George, who stayed and helped, uh, Paulina, of course, Black Box Studios, where we hosted it. They were fantastic and assisted on every level they possibly could. But it was manic. You know, I worked those show days. Firstly, what I know now is if I ever do this again at a show, it will be the day before the show and not the day after because I was so just scraped down to the bone that I feel really good about what I did. But looking back, I know that I would have not necessarily been better, but different right. and more whole had I done it at the beginning versus the end. So that was one of the biggest learning things for me. Um, and for those of you who don't know how these things work, I mean, we had a studio rental that was the day after WPPI. I got off the floor at the last day of the show floor. We immediately went 
Matt got parked out with boxes. We had Uber XLs and bell hops and all of this gear was delivered. And it all had to be built out that evening when we're all just literally running on fumes with the knowledge that that's not even the thing. That's just the preface to the thing. Right. Um, but overall, I was I was really happy with how it turned out. You know, we were sold out at the workshop. The studio space turned out great. I feel like relative to circumstance and ability and opportunity, we really capitalized and did the best that we could possibly do. Um, and I'm happy that a lot of people seem to have had a really wonderful experience. They felt challenged. They felt appreciated. They felt safe. Um, to be who they were in those moments. And so I didn't necessarily want to have a counterpoint to WPPI because I feel like that's disparaging to what the show actually was. Right. And that's very relativistic. But I wanted something that is exactly what we've been talking about that was more focused on genuine connection, that was more focused on intentionally creating, that was more focused on connecting with ourselves and one another and with models, that was just more focused on something that was, to me, more whole and wholehearted. Um, and to that end, I feel like it went really well, but I mean, I have my own legal pad full of notes going, oh, I, I could have done this better. I could have educated better on this. I was so consumed and concerned with not only wanting to provide the best experience, but also wanting to address what I felt like were shortcomings of the conference. And that was, that's a toxic trait I have. And that's something that I, I overburdened myself with. Because I'm like, I know, Johnny, you're going to do this. And you are this educator. And Paulina is this. But I'm like, not only do you have to be who you are, but you have to get even bigger than that to make sure that the experience resonates for the experiences that weren't had at WPPI, at TPM. And that's purely on me. But yeah, it was, it was fucking chaotic. And it was fast. And it was a blur. And I still don't know exactly what happened. But I'm pretty sure it was fucking amazing and i'll probably have to continue to process for for weeks before that that I, I gained some clarity on everything yeah you know from where i sat with it in so far as helping with the setup which that again that black box studio was phenomenal yeah, what a space what an amazing space they have being able to get everything set up that actually went pretty pretty quickly because i think you know i know your setup style and generally yeah. how you light, right? So it was easy to get some of these things set up. And God knows Paulina brought an entire studio worth of backdrops. Literally and madness. Madness. So having all that, the setup wasn't that big of a thing. It was more Great. containing the ideas and saying, we can do anything here. We've do got we to set it up in such a way that when the 12 students come through, 10 or 12 students come through, that there is some order to this chaos. Yeah. And I think everybody that rolled in was one blown away by the sheer volume of creativity that they could play with all these different bays that were set up and Pavo tubes and large lights and hard lights and projectors and just all of the toys. Right. I think with it being, you had mentioned doing it before WPPI and not after I think that I'd lend some credence to that because by about one o'clock, we all started at eight 30 or nine in the morning. And then by about one or two o'clock, you could start <laughs> to see the fumes, right? And oh, absolutely. Like, a couple more hours. And then as we started to get closer to the end of the day, and I realized that some of the bays weren't being used. I'm like, let me start breaking down because I know yeah. we only have X amount of hours at the studio. I started breaking it down. And then I think the, Fortunate and unfortunate. I think some people saw me doing that and were like, oh, God, thank God the workshop is over because I'm exhausted. <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 keep shooting. This is just yeah. me. Like, I got what yeah. I needed, you know. From a participant standpoint, it was amazing to be able to work directly with the models, to be able yeah. to have an idea and craft your own thing and work with a model to create that, but then also have access to you and Paulina and all yeah. of the other students that were there. And I found yeah. that is the culture that, that you lose at trade shows. It's, yeah. it's impossible to recreate in a large scale is that intimacy of creation between students, right? Starting to brainstorm together. And what if we did this? And what if we did that? And then working the model in, and what if we did that? And I think, those are the things that are missing. Now, the workshop that you put on was phenomenal. I think the other thing that I saw you do in the week, which 
I don't know how you pulled it off. I I got to tell you is Kayla Douglas's VIP party. For those of you that don't know, Kayla Douglas and uh, Rick Lewis, they have their wings. They have uh, backdrops. They've got a bunch of stuff. They it's have, it's this, a, a, a this suite this of offerings. And so they rented a house. They had a ticket only attendance at yeah. this VIP event and beautiful home off site. And every room from the bathroom to the living room, to the bedrooms, to the everywhere outside, everything was styled. Yeah. Stella, I think it was uh light motion. Stella lit yep. everything, but you and Paulina came in. Like we went over early, but a couple hours before the party started and had to get everything ready. Yeah. And I don't know what was going through your mind as you were looking at these rooms and thinking styling, lighting. All I saw was Johnny zipping back and forth <laughs> from room to room. I was just sitting at a table having a cocktail and I just saw you like a Tasmanian devil. What was going through your head to get this thing all set up? So I, I wanted to create a relatively stress-free, effortless way for people to come in and see beautiful styling, see beautiful environmental elements, see beautiful lighting, and then engage with that. Right. Um, and there's so many moving parts to those of you who haven't been involved in productions like this. When it's done really well, it's almost like magic because you're like, wow, that looked effortless. It is never fucking effortless. It is always very effortful. Um, there is so much that goes into it and so many moving parts and the logistics and things invariably go wrong because that's life. Right. And that's just the nature of it. So I wanted people to come in and just be able to have a good time and to relax and to connect and still do those modifications and things. But for it to be more of a like, hey, I'm here, I'm going to have a beer or a glass of wine or a cocktail or too many edibles, as so many people did. And yeah. and, <laughs> and just and, and have fun and create some semblance of diversity. Um, but first and foremost, you know, when I was setting that up, it's how I always operate. Like there were these models there and they were being styled. And I'm like, I want them to feel like kings, to feel like queens, to feel like royalty. I want them to see me sweating because that's me giving to them. And they're going to be giving the rest of the night to everyone else. Right. So I wanted to start with that precedent that, yeah, like I'm here and I am who I am. If you happen to know me, if I have any cachet or notoriety in your mind, and I'm being of service to you because you're going to be of service to so many. Yeah. Um, and I think sort of like WPPI and TPM, people come in and they have this really, I, I love it almost. And I don't say naive in a negative way at all. I think it's beautiful and wonderful. It's like a child, but this sort of naivety and they're so excited to create that that intention once again falls by the wayside. Yeah. And so as people started showing up, you know, they're photographing these models because they're stunning and they're beautifully styled and it's this beautiful space. But like, you know, the light is at sternum level and they're photographing and I'm like, hey, everyone, I'm like, I'm not trying to be rude. I love how excited you are. But like, let's see what happens when we raise this above the eyes. Ooh, we can see cheekbones. Oh, there's life in the eyes. Oh, this is flattering. You know, we're not doing Frankenstein's monster uplighting on this individual who's there just unaware of what they look like or what they're doing, who's just operating on that professional sort of status quo wavelength. Right. Um, so I wanted to make sure that that everyone was being honored. And once again, that's just me being an empath. I take on too much, but it was the challenge too. Um, that's one of the biggest reasons I went to WPPI and took on these things was like, I wanted to some extent and not in a macabre way, feel like there was a gun to my head right. and to say like, this is go time, make something fucking magical, make something wonderful. The pieces of this puzzle are here for you. All of the pieces are in place. Now it's your job puzzle master to put them all fucking together in a cohesive way that is resonant, that's significant, that's different, that's atypical, that's unexpected. You know, and of course, crazy shit happens. We're trying to set up Stella's lights, and then we have power packs that only support, support 60 watts, but the lights are drawing 120 watts, so every time they go over 50%, they die. We have people kicking things over. We have rooms that aren't working. I'm trying to move these things, this beautifully decorated home going, oh, this Boz is probably worth more than my life and everything that I own shakily moving it to the next thing um but it was just it for me it was it was about everyone being able to be there and staying focused and being present on themselves on one another on the models on colleagues and just to be able to be there without the stress or the pressure or that that idea that I need to create something significant because so much of that significance was sort of built in 
so that they could just say, oh, this is significant. So I can simply be and be present and do what it is I want to do without those other variables coming into that equation. You know, I looked at that workshop, not the workshop, the party. And I wondered a couple of things as I sat there and took it all in. Now, I brought my camera with me, but I I think I took more behind-the-scenes photos yeah. than I did of the model. And there were a ton of models there, and oh. everything was just off the charts beautiful. Wow. Like, this house was just insane. But I was wondering, for workshops like that, if you're going to have a VIP party, and I can't, I can't imagine the expense of it, but would it be better because I'm always looking for ways to improve things Same. is having time slots of saying your ticket gets you from six 30 to seven 30. Yeah. Your ticket gets you from seven 30 to eight 30. That way it doesn't feel as chaotic as yeah. frantic with yep. all these amazing photographers that are great in their own right. Yeah. All kind of shuffling and trying to work past each other. None of which are the type to be shooting over shoulders and everybody's yeah. super respectful. But at the same time, you get to a point where time is compressed and you want to get all the things. So you start to have multiple photographers in the room at yeah. the same time. And it does become like that thing where you're almost missing out on the action starts yeah. to build and it feels rushed. It feels forced. Yeah. So I'm wondering if there's that secondarily, you know, is there a, a, a laminated, bill of rights for photographers or rules of the road that we hand out at the front door saying here's the deal here's yeah. you know the here's how to be respectful and yeah. i don't i don't mean this in a condescending way like like no. i'm on high and no one else knows these rules yeah. but just to reinforce it for workshops for party yeah. for all these yeah. places so that you start to create a standard of yeah. behavior that then trickles down to the trade show level yep. and what happens at the shooting base. So oh, it's, it's code of conduct type of stuff. Code absolutely. of conduct is the word I was looking for, not not Bill of Rights. But the code of conduct, I just feel like that almost needs to be enforced at yeah. everything. Agreed. Um, otherwise, we're just entitling people to do that constant shooting everybody gets the same shot so no one is unique no one actually has a voice and i don't know it 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 by no means was a bad time i'm not no. saying that at all i think there are just ways that we can improve this so that the subtle undertone is that we raise everybody up to be a better creative a better producer a better helper a better assistant everything starts to raise up a little bit well, I, I think what we deal with at these events so overtly, and I know that I've done this in my workshops directly and indirectly, consciously and subconsciously, is there's the double-edged sword, sort of like the stiletto blade of people becoming so at ease and comfortable yeah. that everything becomes friendly, right? And so in that friendliness, we lose professional decorum. Yeah. And then you take somewhere like Vegas where things like booze and weed or whatever else are omnipresent. And you've had a couple of Dos Equis and you've smoked the joint and everyone's ribbing you and you feel really good. And so you go over and you're just like, you've been having a great talk with the model and maybe you even had a drink with them. And then you're like, oh, just move your leg this way. Right. And instead of saying, hey, do you mind if I touch you? It's just an assumptiveness. And there's no maliciousness in that nine times out of 10. But there is an, a, a degree of familiarity, which I don't necessarily think is healthy. Yeah. And so that goes back to that code of conduct to say, hey, we're all here together, but we're going to respect each other. We're going to respect our colleagues, the models, production staff. And there's a certain level of almost like old world politeness that needs to come with this where you're like, even if I know you, I'm still going to ask if it's OK if I shoot alongside you, because that's a basic courtesy. And if you say yes, I'm going to go great. And if you say no, I'm going to go. Thank you for being honest with me. And I'm going to step back. Yep. But that just blurs and then everyone's trying to get everything and everyone's exhausted and everyone's just a little whatever they are. Um, so I agree with you 110 percent. But this has to be something that is macrocosmic, yeah. because if you only are faced with that type of code of conduct or whatever we want to call it in one specific instance, it's so isolated that it can't possibly bleed. So this has to be a sort of industry wide effort to say when we come together in mass, whether that's a mass of three or three thousand 
These are the basic things that we do for ourselves and one another to make sure that everyone is being respected, to make sure that we're operating with a certain degree of professionalism, and to make sure that everyone feels comfortable and safe and at ease, because that's how we all get the most out of it. Yeah. Um, and that's definitely an uphill battle, but it's one that we have to sort of step into because if we don't, no one will. Yeah. The way that I've always looked at it is that if you're not actively pressing the shutter button, meaning you're not the one that's yeah. shooting the model right there, the subject, whoever it might be, then you immediately fall into the role of assistant and yeah, you're exactly. looking around, Hey, do you yeah. want me to change your lighting for you yeah. cool with this? Do you need more yeah. space? You know, what about this? I don't see enough of that. It's just people assume the identity of photographer yeah. and they, they don't want to revert to being an assistant or, yeah. you know, a producer of some sort. And yeah. You know, you'd, you'd mentioned, that, you know, there's a light pointed at a sternum and there's just a floating head up here somewhere. That's that code of conduct, right? Take yeah. a look before you take a picture, take a look at what's going on. It's okay to change the lights. I think in some of these settings, people are so programmed that, all right, it's set up. Therefore, yeah. it must be perfect already. Yeah. Johnny set it up. It must be perfect already. Yeah. They don't know that you're just like, yeah, just put a fucking light in there somewhere. <laughs> They'll fix it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And People aren't taking that time to just slow down, look at the situation and say either, A, is this what I want? B, is yep. this what they want? Can we help? How do we create better? There are pros and cons with it, but it has to be something that does permeate the larger community. Absolutely. And the, only way that, the only way that happens is if people are talking about it. I think yep. in, the, in the quiet hallways and in the dark corners, we all have this conversation. Of course. So why not bring it to light? And how do we bring it to light? Well, and, and, and I, think, I think another part of that, too, that's sort of like to piggyback on that or run on those coattails is so often if we look at the shooting bay sort of scenario again, you know, you get two minutes. And most of the time what it is is there is a placard on the wall. And it says, all right, you're going to be at F5.6 and ISO 200 in one two hundredth of a second. And we suggest shooting this at 50 millimeter focal length. And yep. these are the exact settings. So there, there is no room for experimentation. People are almost programmed into that programming to say like, all right, I operate on the wavelength I am told to operate on. And I think that itself is really damaging to the artist archetype because then you don't learn to critically think for yourself. You simply regurgitate based on what it is you are being force fed. Now, I understand there are massive logistical limitations when you have 2,000 people in a room and everyone's trying to shoot. You can't let everyone spend 10 minutes and do whatever they want because it would be fucking complete chaos. chaos. But I do think that there is room to build in to say like, hey, maybe you can't move the light, but you could turn this light on or off. Sort of what I was trying to do. Or maybe, you know, you can turn the model this way or here's a piece of styling you could add to or remove. And that way people have to be more active in the process of creation and think and operate on a, on a wavelength that is their own rather than the common consensus of what is right or what is wrong. Um, and like you said, I think that's what happened at the VIP party. People were like, oh, you know, the Stella crew was great. They were going around and setting things up. They weren't interested in designing lighting. They were like, holy fuck, we need right. to get all 20 of these lights out so the person who's designing lighting can do what it is they need to do. Right. which is the nature of production that I didn't have a chance to get around or Rick or whoever else. And so someone's like, Oh, there's a light here and it's on. Like we're good to go yeah. without going like, are we good to go though? And that's simply because everything else they were exposed to were like, when a light's on, you shoot. Right. When there's a model there, you shoot. It's that simple and reductionist. And the problem is I think people take that mindset back to their clients, back to their art, back to their studios where, where they look at things and then suddenly they're at this stalwart place where they're frozen because they're like, well, what do I do? And that's the artist's fucking quandary is what do you do and why? And so as, as conferences, as businesses, as educators and mentors, I think we need to do a better job of not just giving someone something, but explaining to them what it is we are giving them and why and asking them to ask themselves if what is being given to them serves them and the person in front of their camera or not, and then giving them at least a little bit of freedom to pivot or change if the answer that to that question is not a definitive yes, it is. 